Welcome to episode 20 of my guide to video game history. And what a mega episode we have for you as we look at the 90s and gaming's first tender steps to using CDs. To tell the story we first need to rewind back to 1980 when the compact disc or CD was first becoming a reality in the home for music. This new media was an offshoot of the laser disc technology that had been previously done and it would allow hundreds of megabytes of data to be stored on a 12 centimeter disc. Pioneered by two electronic giants, the Japanese Sony and the Dutch firm Philips, they would work on a series of standards. But with a typical CD player costing £399 just to play music, it was simply too costly for game machines or computers to consider it yet. Even in 1987, when the Japanese Sharp machine, the X68000, costing 370,000 yen was released, no CD would be considered. Incidentally, this machine was quite a success in Japan, with Hudson Soft helping with many of the games, and it would be home to some of the greatest arcade home ports of the time, with such titles as Space Harrier, Afterburner and Parodius gracing the machine. And it's a real shame this was never ever released outside of Japan. Nope, it would be in late 1988 that Japanese these gamers would get their first taste of what CD gaming could do for them when NEC released an add-on CD peripheral for their PC Engine console. Called the PC Engine CD-ROM 2, it would sell for an expensive 32,800 yen, about £250. And that had no bundled game with it, and of course you needed the original console as well. But for those of the money, you would get some wonderful games released for it such as Ease 1 and 2, a brilliant adventure with the CD using full cut scenes and actual speech. In the US, they would see this peripheral on the 1st of August 1990, when NEC released it as the Turbo Graphics CD and selling it for $399. It would again gain quite a cult following over in the US with a stack of wonderful games released for the machine. In Japan, 1989, Fujitsu released the FM Towns PC, an expensive home PC that didn't do particularly well in Japan, with it not being open-ended as the IBM PC was for upgradability or software. But it is notable as being the first machine to come with a CD drive as standard. Fujitsu tried twice more with their home PC with the FM Towns Marty in 1993 and the FM Towns Marty 2 in 1994 but sadly they made little impact on the more widespread IBM compatible PC. For us in the UK our first experience of CD gaming came in 1989 in the form of the Codemasters CD Gaming Pack which was a CD with 30 of their best games that could be connected to a Spectrum or a Commodore 64. It was a great idea and extremely clever, using the initial game loading tape and then a joystick port to load the game. Unfortunately, most kids still didn't have the expensive CD player, and so for many, this clever piece of kit passed us by. No, we wouldn't really see CD gaming until March 1991, when Commodore decided to release the Commodore Dynamic Total Vision, or CDTV as it was more commonly known. This was essentially an Amiga 500 put into a shiny VCR-looking black box and with a remote control, and it would cost a whopping £499. That's $1,100. As CD players were still expensive to buy at the time, and so adding about £100 to the price of any machine. And because of this high price point that Commodore had to do, they decided to aim the device not as a games console, but as a luxury multimedia centre, insisting it only be sold in electronic stores, and only alongside the other hi-fis and VCR and CD players of the time rather than the computer section. 
The machine was a major flop, with the price point being far too high to encourage people to buy the device that initially had only educational titles and electronic books. For myself, I remember going round to a friend's house who'd bought this and being impressed. He had the Hutchinson's Encyclopedia, and it seemed amazingly futuristic to me at the time that an entire bookshelf worth of volumes could be crammed on such a small CD. Some games were released for it, such as a brilliant Sim City, which had actual actors giving you advice and news crews lambasting and reporting on disasters. Then there was Trivial Pursuit, which had grainy video questions questions occasionally, but basically was typical Trivial Pursuit. But many of the game's titles released for the machine made little use of the CD, often being just ports of Amiga games. I couldn't afford the CD TV myself, but I did buy the A570 peripheral in 1992 that plugged into the Amiga 500. This was great, especially when the public domain company 17-bit released their entire catalogue across four CDs. This was amazing to me at the time. The idea of having every demo and PD game released at my fingertips and it made one of the best purchases for me of all time. Another machine released in December 1991 was the Philips new machine, the CDI. Originally the work had been started for a device back in 1984 with a planned release date of 1988. But with undermanned development team and bizarre requirements from Philips meant that it would take years to make. The problem was that the device setup hadn't changed since its initial designs, and so it would be out of date before it even would be released and be massively overpriced at $700, about £350. Again, due to this high price point, Philips tried to market the device not as a game's console but as a multimedia device with it even having an internet browser and later offering a digital video cartridge that allowed you to even watch films on video cd although this would set you back a whopping 150 pounds but on its release there was only one real game that you could play and that was jigsaw a rudimentary and dull virtual jigsaw program you see to write software for the philips cdi was an absolute nightmare with the hardware being buggy and incomplete. Despite all this, titles would start to be released, such as the interactive movie game Voyeur in 1993, where you played a private eye hired to put together enough dirt to bring down the CEO. It was a poor game, but with adult themes and partial nudity, it gained quite a popularity at the time. The other game, such as Futuristic Burn Cycle, also was quite a hit, although, to be honest, not very good. And of course, thanks to a deal with Nintendo, some of those games that would be released for the Philips CDI were some of Nintendo's most prestigious game characters, such as Link, Zelda and Mario. Released in October 1993, these games were sadly pretty poor, with Link, Faces of Evil, being a cringe-worthily bad RPG platformer. It was a real missed opportunity on Philips' part. Zelda The Wind of Gamelon had you play Princess Zelda this time on a quest to rescue Link, who doesn't return after she sends him to find the king. This game was also pretty bad, and again, another missed opportunity. Finally, slightly better, but released in 1995, when another company had a stab at things, they created Zelda Adventure. This at least had a top-down perspective and felt more like a Zelda game, and compared to the others was much better to play. However, it's safe to say that these games remain a bit of a blot on the Zelda series, with Electronic Game Monthly magazine even voting the three games the worst games of all time. Slightly better was Hotel Mario, released in 1994, where you played Mario in Cooper hotel shutting all the doors whilst avoiding the enemy nasties. They even started work on a Super Mario platform game called Super Mario's Wacky Worlds. It was sadly cancelled as by then it was clear that the CDI's days were numbered. But how had Philips managed to arrange such a coup as using some of Nintendo's greatest game characters? Well, it all started back in 1988 when Sony started to work with Nintendo on creating a CD-ROM peripheral for Nintendo's new console, the Super Famicom. 
But as the partnership progressed, Nintendo realised that they got into bed with a dangerous partner, with Sony clearly showing desires to take a slice of the marketplace, with Sony having plans to additionally release a SNES-compatible console of their own. Dubbed the PlayStation, it would take SNES cartridges and Sony's new CD format, the SuperDisc. But for the Super Disc, Nintendo would see hardly any money at all on royalties of games released in that format. Nintendo could see how things were going and it feared that they were being used by Sony to gain a step into their core business and then they would steal it away. So one month before Nintendo's CD add-on was planned to be announced, at the Chicago Consumer Electronics Show, or CES, in 1991, Nintendo CEO Hiroshi Yamuchi instructed his son-in-law, the head of Nintendo of America, Minoru Arakawa, to travel to Eindhoven in Holland and instead make negotiations with Philips. So, at the Chicago CES exhibition, on the first day, Sony publicly and proudly announced the development of the PlayStation and their involvement with Nintendo. And with such news went down a media storm as of course this was exciting the fact that Nintendo and Sony joining forces really enticed and enthralled the gaming press. But on the second day of the CES, Nintendo called a press meeting of their own, and instead of confirming more details of the PlayStation as everyone thought, they instead told everyone that they planned to drop Sony and instead work with Philips to release their CD add-on. Sony was understandably enraged, with them losing some serious face and an embarrassing many of the key people at Sony, and instead decided to work on their own non-Nintendo compatible console that would be released two years later and still with the name PlayStation. But more on this console in the next episode. Nintendo themselves decided to drop doing any CD peripheral for their SNES console in the end as they were concerned that by moving away from cartridges they would lose their stranglehold over publishers and also the slowness of the CD format at the time. But out of the deal, Philips did get the rights to make Nintendo-themed games for their console, the CDI. But by then, the CDI was all but obsolete, with gamers already looking on to newer consoles being released, and the Philips CDI would fade away. No, the first worldwide successful release of a CD console was Sega's add-on CD for the Mega Drive or Genesis. Called the Mega CD in Japan and Europe and Sega CD in America, it was originally released to the Japanese market for 49,000 yen in 1991 and quickly followed in the US for $300 and eventually in Europe all the way in 1993 for £270. Back in 1990, Sega felt on top of the world, having done the seemingly impossible task of winning a major chunk of the console market from Nintendo. They felt they could do no wrong, and they were actively encouraged by Sega to come up with new ideas to follow. A way to epitomise the mood at Sega at the time, in America at least, was that the staff wore t-shirts saying, This may not work. But what the hell? The machine began to make waves, with many Genesis or Mega Drive owners clambering to get the new peripheral for their console, with 200,000 units sold in the US by the end of 1992, and 60,000 units in the UK within six months. Numbers which could have been much higher if it weren't for the fact that Sega was struggling to make enough devices. This popularity was at the beginning thanks really to two full motion video games released on the 15th of October 1992. There was Sewer Shark which was set in the future, in a world where humanity is forced to live underground. In the game you play a rookie pilot, Pest Exterminator, who must fly through the underground pipes and kill all the mutated creatures that are a threat to the humans. The next game was Night Trap, where you played a Sega Control Attack team member or scat agent who must secretly monitor a girl's slumber party to investigate why when another sleepover previously happened at this house all the girls went missing you quickly discover that there are these vampire like creatures called augurs who are trying to kill them and so by setting traps you attempt to capture them all 
Both games were designed by Digital Pictures and had been done by Tom Zito way back in 1985 for the Nolan Bushnell company called Axlon. The failed console that they were working on was called Nemo and it was a clever VHS based system that allowed interactive movies to play. The system was eventually dropped as a no-go but Tom Zito who had made the games and seeing a possibility down the line to reuse them decided to buy the rights for the games. Then, years later, when CD games were becoming a possibility, he would release the games initially for the Sega Mega CD and then for other CD consoles of the time. It is perhaps ironical that his first attempt was for the Nintendo PlayStation add-on, and it's a shame, really, that on the snares with its massive colour palette, the videos look great, but on the Sega Mega Drive, it looked really quite grainy and washed out. To be honest, these games weren't that great, though they were exciting for the time. One of the main reasons for the huge success of particularly Night Trap, at least, was for all thanks to Congress in America. Led by US Senator Joe Lieberman and Herb Cole, they started to be concerned with the increased violence in video games and the fact that kids were able to buy and play these games with the game's rating, if any, being purely voluntary on the part of the game publisher. And so he set out to do a Congress hearing to set up some form of compulsory regulatory body. This congressional hearing was held in June in 1993 and was a major media circus at the time and resulted in two things happening. Firstly, it would set up the Video Rating Council by Sega that, although she was short-lived, would at least set the path to a rating system that's used today in video games. Secondly, every gaming kid in the world suddenly wanted to play these taboo games that had been so sensationalised by the congressional hearing. And so consequently, games like Night Trap would start to sell exceptionally well. Sega's Mega CD may have garnered initial interest with games such as Night Trap, but it would be the, the continuing string of top quality titles such as Sonic CD released in September 1993 that would really entice the gamers to the Mega CD. Sonic CD made fantastic use of the CD being a great game to boot. But for me, the best game released was Popful Mail, released in 1994 by developer Falcon, who had done the brilliant Ease games. If you haven't played Popful Mail, then I would really encourage you to go and track it down, as it's a phenomenally good game, where you play a lady bounty hunter called Popful Mail on a quest to make some money. The game is a joy to play, being a platform RPG and incredibly fun, and the Sega CD is a great version of the game. Another great game release was Konami's game called Snatcher by Hideo Kojima, who's best known today for his Metal Gear Solid games. The game originally came out on the PC Engine, but this version made full use of the CD, with great music and full recorded voices. When you combine this with a compelling cyberpunk adventure that mixed in elements of Blade Runner and Terminator in the game, you have a wonderful game that really needs to be played by more. There were stacks of other great games released for the Mega or Sega CD, and there are too many to mention here in this episode, but suffice to say it's well worth giving this great system a go and tracking down these games. Over on the PC, 1993 was a great year as it was beginning to adopt CD games. One of the first CD games to make huge waves was Seventh Guest, released in April 1993 by Trilobite Software. It had been set up by two Virgin Mastertronic staff members, the American Rob Landeros and the Scottish Graham Devine as they amicably left to set up their own company to write this new game. Incidentally, Graham Devine would go on to work for id Software, and so do Quake 3, Doom 3, and most recently did Halo Wars for Microsoft. The game mixed in pre-rendered 3D static images and combined it with video footage as you attempted to make your way around the spooky old mansion, solving puzzles in each room. The game was amazing for the time, being on two CDs and costing originally 
a whopping £70 on its release. But despite the high cost, it really was worth it for CD drive owners, as it really showed what the CD format could do. In June 1993, LucasArts would take the plunge themselves into the world of CD, releasing Maniac Mansion 2, Day of the Tentacle. This was the continued talents of Dave Grossman and Tim Schafer, who had all worked on the brilliant secret of Monkey Island games. The game is brilliant, with three friends on an adventure to save the world from being overrun by tentacles. When the purple tentacle of the first game turns evil due to the toxic waste in the Dr. Fred Edison's Back Garden River. The game involved using time machines, with the Doc sending your three hapless heroes to three different time zones, with the nerd Bernard keeping to the present, whilst the rocker Hoagie goes back 200 years to the time of George Washington, and the ditzy girl Laverne goes 200 years in the future, where the world is run by the tentacles, and the humans are treated as pets. This three-tier storyline worked brilliantly, as if you got stuck on one puzzle, you could always switch to the other character and continue their story. It was at this time that a new kind of game magazine was released, called Edge, in August this year. This magazine was more like a coffee table book, rather than the throwaway magazines of the time. But they would continue to gain quite a following with the magazine, offering in-depth interviews and well-researched articles, as opposed to the many other kid-like publications that were out there at the time. Another early PC game was released in September 1993, and it was called Mist. And it was created by a company called Cyan, by two brothers, Rand and Robin Miller, who had previously made quite obscure adventure games, such as the game Manhole in 1998, and Cosmic Osmo and the Worlds Beyond the Mackerel in 1989. But in the game Mist, you play a stranger who finds a book that whisks him away to the mysterious island of Mist, where you must solve puzzles to find further books to help you escape. The game's basically like Seventh Guest, and was really a series of pre-rendered postcard images. But the dreamlike world of the island, and the well-thought-out puzzles, made it another huge hit, as PC gamers were desperate to have titles that made good use of their new CD drive. November 1993 would see another LucasArts adventure, this time by Steve Purcell, who took his 1988 comic book called Sam and Max Freelance Police, which had two wise-cracking characters, a deadpan dog called Sam and a crazy psychotic rabbit called Max. The game called Sam and Max Hit the Road was created by Steve and some of LucasArts development veterans, and it was brilliant, being absolutely hilarious, involving your heroes on a quest to find out where two carnival attractions, the frozen Bigfoot Bruno and Trixie the Draftnet Girl, have escaped to, and so taking you across on a madcap adventure across tourist dub locations throughout America. Also this month, LucasArts would release a new Star Wars game called Rebel Assault. This was an interactive movie for the PC, and gameplay-wise it was block hard and quite limited. But for Star Wars fans, the extra storyline and new Star Wars footage in the game made it well worth a play. Sierra would also start to embrace the CD format in December this year, with the beginning of their Gabriel Knights trilogy, with Gabriel Knights Sins of the Father. This was a great horror-themed adventure, where you played a horror book writer called Gabriel, who follows a police investigation into a spate of voodoo killings. The game was brilliant, with its adult horror story being the perfect alternative to the LucasArts comedies. The CD version of the game was also a real lavish affair, enlisting such voice talents as Tim Curry and Mark Hamill, to name but a few. But 1993 wasn't just about the PC. Two game consoles would also be released at the end of the year. First was Commodore's new console called the CD32, released in September for £250. And this time, Commodore had learned from all their mistakes of the CD TV disaster. The console was totally geared for games this time, 
and with it using the powerful Amiga 1200 computer, it had some real hardware potential. Unfortunately, in the US at least, a court case Commodore was fighting meant that they couldn't officially release their new console to the US. And so it was only really Europe of which they had hoped to make an impact. But at least in Europe it was their most popular market, with Amiga being very well received and loved there. And in the UK, Commodore pulled out all the stops with the fiercely attacking ad campaign against Sega Mega CD, famously even putting an ad right outside Sega UK quarters saying to be this good takes Sega ages. Being a parody, of course, of the Sega ad campaign to be this good takes Sega. The console itself was quite a handsome beast, being quite compact and bundled with two games, Diggers and Oscar. Nice enough games, but not really impressive enough to warrant people purchasing the console. And that, essentially, was the problem with the console. Most of the games that were being offered were nothing more than Amiga games. But when the big market of people who would buy the CD32 already owned the Amiga, there didn't seem much point to the console. Despite this, there was quite a few sold in the UK. With all the hype and an affordable console and games, 100,000 consoles were sold. Sadly, the UK was not a big enough region for Commodore to survive, and with the Amiga market shrinking, Commodore would file for bankruptcy in 1994, and so the CD32 would die shortly after it begun. The other machine released was the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer, released in October 1993, and it was a much more interesting prospect. To tell the story of the 3DO, we must first go back to Atari Lynx, when Amiga guru RJ Miko, Dave Needle and Dave Morse had quit Epix when they sold the Lynx to Atari. And so after they'd resigned, they were all out at lunch together and saying, gee guys, what are we going to do next? They decided what they wanted to do next was do cool stuff, and so do a cutting-edge game console that would be ten times more powerful than the Sega Genesis console. They set up a company called New Technologies and set to work on this new machine. They now had the console design and just needed the capital to make it happen, and so they met venture capitalist Dean Hovey about it. Dean was excited as he'd just spoken to the Electronic Arts founder, Trip Hawkins, who was bemoaning the state of the industry with countless game consoles being released, and what was needed was a standard platform for the industry to adopt. This, of course, had been tried by Microsoft with the MSX years before. All Trip was missing was the console for the industry to adopt. So Dave Hovey got the guys together, and with $100 million capital that Trip put in, they set up the company 3DO, and they set to work. The machine was a real powerhouse, and the elegant design and some wonderful ideas, such as no region knockouts in the games, and daisy chaining of controllers. But the problem was, was the 3DO only licensed the technology, and so pricings were determined by the manufacturers themselves. And Matashita chose the extortionate price of $699, and although they would drop it to $499 the following year, the damage had been done, with many people in the industry jokingly calling it that the 3DO, the three dozen ordered, or the three doll and, of course, the 3DOA. The other problem with the console was that such cheap licensing on the games that 3DO took, being only $3 per game, meant that 3DO could never re really recoup the costs, and so invest in developing software titles for themselves, and so were totally reliant on third-party developers. Other electronic giants, such as Panasonic and Goldstar, also licensed the machine, and with the flexibility to hone the console design for the local region, the machine did quite well in Japan. Still, some great games were released for the console, with Need for Speed by Electronic Arts that looked amazing for the time, and there was Road Rash which included great music from bands like Soundgarden and was a gorgeous, fast, enjoyable update of the game. There was also a platformer called Gex, 
which became the unofficial mascot for the console. Other great games that were released was a lavishly done Star Control 2, a brilliant strategy game made even better with full speech in the game to complement the engaging game. Then there was Mega Race, a futuristic racer, that certainly looked the part even though it didn't play that well. Still, there was no two ways about it, the 3DO sold badly, and so Tripp and his team set about to work on the follow-up console called the M2, or Bulldog console. It was never released, and reportedly Tripp, who let's face it could sell a fridge to an Eskimo, managed to sell the rights of the M2 to Matsushita for a cool $100 million, recouping his initial investment on the 3DO company before it went bankrupt. Bizarrely, Matsushita didn't really know what to do with the white elephant that they just purchased. And so they ended up using the M2 in such bizarre places as vending machines in Japan. The following month, in November 1993, Atari would release their new console called the Atari Jaguar for $249.99 and in the UK £199.99. But to tell how this console came about, one has to go back to 1986, when three Sinclair research employees, Martin Brennan, John Matheson and Ben Cheese, would quit when Sinclair was sold to Amstrad. And they set up their own company called Flare Technology and started work on their own game console called the Conix. The system never got released due to a lack of funding. But it was an impressive system, with an ingenious controller that can be changed to suit different games. Incidentally, Ben Cheese decided to leave Flare Technology after the Conix console didn't go anywhere, and he would go and join Argonaut Software, and so would become the genius designer behind the Nintendo Super FX chip. Flare Technologies, not to be deterred, went back to the drawing board and designed their new console. They showed this new design to Atari, who were so impressed that they cancelled their own console they were working on at the time, called the Panther, and hired Flare to build them their their new console. The console was impressively designed, being 64-bit, although it was incredibly tough to program for, having multiple CPUs, and also that it had a terrible old-style controller that looked like it belonged to a console of the time of Atari VCS, let alone a console of the 90s. But the real problem with the Jaguar was the time it was released. At that period, Atari was struggling, with its core business dwindled, and so simply didn't have the money to invest in a huge marketing campaign. And, in a market already oversaturated with countless game consoles, it stood little chance to survive. Also, the console used cartridges, and so flew in the face of the other consoles of the time. And although they did release a toilet seat looking peripheral, which could play CDs, it was made in 1995, and by then it was too little, too late. A few great games were released for the console, such as Jeff Minter's Tempest 2000, which was a great update of the Tempest arcade game, and Aliens vs Predator that made good use of the hardware, but in the main, most games were poor. In 1994, the Neo Geo CD was released, and also NEC released in December that year the PCFX in Japan, which was a personal computer designed to compete with IBM-compatible PCs, but with the added advantage of it also being able to play PC Engine games. It was a nice idea, but with announcements of next generation consoles and Windows 95 about to be released, they both didn't last long. Over on the IBM PC and compatibles, however, gaming had really hit full swing, with the release of the third game in Chris Roberts' space opera, Wing Commander 3, Heart of the Tiger. This time they would use real actors in the roles, and with such a lineup of pedigree actors such as Mark Hamill, he of Star Wars fame, Malcolm McDowell, he of Clockwork Orange fame, Tom Wilson from Back to the Future, and even John Rhys Davies, who would go on to play Gimli the Dwarf in Lord of the Rings. With that kind of lineup, you knew you were in for something special. 
and the game didn't disappoint, with it being a great shooter, and with such well-acted storyline and lavish production values, it really drew you into the tale. Even better was Wing Commander 4, released in 1995 the following year. This had even higher production values, and a film blockbuster budget of $12 million dollars a sum unheard of in gaming at the time. This continued the story even further, but with much more complex storyline and compelling gameplay for you to follow. Sierra as well were also in full swing, releasing the brilliant Phantasmagoria by Roberta Williams. It was a horror adventure where you play a female paperback writer who moves in with her husband to a spooky mansion where her husband gets possessed by a demon. This game was adult stuff, and especially by the normally family-friendly Roberta, but it's possibly one of the best examples of how to do a video adventure using full motion videos and actors, and it's well worth a play, even today. Also released were such adventure classics as Tex Murphy Under a Killing Moon, which was released in November 94. This was the third in the futuristic noir series, and by this time they additionally had real actors replacing the hand-drawn characters of the first two games. The PC would continue with many classic games and classic adventure games, making full use of the CD technology. But that's a story for a later episode. Anyway, look out for my next episode where Sega would release their new console onto the market called the Sega Saturn. Oh, and I suppose there was another company called Sony that would try and enter the video game market with their new console, the Sony PlayStation. So, until next time, see you later.